I want to welcome you to the White Coat Ceremony for the Clinical Laboratory Science Program. Damos la bienvenida a todos a la ceremonia de Bata Blanca de Ciencias del Laboratorio Clínico 2018. Uh, I want to introduce the faculty. Uh, I am Mrs. Tijerina. I am the program director, and I have been teaching here for 27 years. Uh, I actually went through the program uh, a long time ago. I was in the second group to go through. Uh, this is uh, Mrs. Crystal Villarreal. She's also a graduate of the program. Uh, Ms. Idania Passat, where are you? Stand up. She's also a graduate of the program. Uh, Beverly, Ms. Beverly Briones is also a graduate of the program. And Dr. Nadetta should be coming uh, he's also a graduate of the program. So practically all of us have been through this program. It's a great program. Um, practically all of the clinical lab scientists in the Valley are graduates of this program. Okay, uh, Dr. Gilkerson and Ms. Aguirre could not be with us tonight. So, uh, but um, hopefully maybe next year they can make it. All right, so tonight we have a very special guest. Uh, I'm going to introduce Dr. Michael Laker. He's the Dean of the College of Health Affairs. He's our leader. Um, he has great visions for us. He's very supportive of the program too. So we really appreciate everything he does for us. So give, let's give Dr. Laker a big hand. <laughs> Well, thank you, and good evening. As a Dean of the College of Health Affairs, very soon to be renamed to the College of Health Professions in the Division of Health Affairs, I have the honor and the privilege to welcome you on behalf of our faculty, staff, and students. Welcome. We are really happy to have you here because you are fabulous, you're exceptional, and I'd like to congratulate you on your great accomplishment and achievements. You have been selected and admitted to a very highly selective, successful, and tough program. Congratulations. I'd like to share with you a few thoughts on education. After all, we're in a university. I might have been a strange kid, and maybe I'm still strange, I'm not so sure. But my heroes were very different from most kids' heroes. My heroes are right there. I don't know if you recognize them. Dr. Robert Koch and Dr. Louis Pasteur both great microbiologists. Incredible contributions to humanity. Incredible struggles. Incredible discoveries. I just love microbiology. So when I went to school, I wanted to be just like them. But this is what I've experienced. This is how my classroom kind of looked like. I was a teacher in front. There was this board, which was called a blackboard. And you actually had chalk that you would have writing on. Uh, there was nothing like PowerPoint or so on. You sat there in your chair. You took notes and you listened. And that was pretty much it. A few questions maybe at the end, but nothing more. And the best skill that you could have had at those times was to memorize. Memorize vast amounts of information. That was important. And it was important because that information that you learned in the classroom was not easy to get by. There was no Google. You could just type it in and get your answer in a second or so. No, either 
you bought some really expensive books that you had in your bookshelf, right? And very few people had them, so that's where you could get the, get the information. And if you didn't have those, you actually had to go to a library, to a physical place where there are books and books and books. And there was a card catalog and reference books. And it probably took you hours and hours to just find a piece of information that you wanted to know. And that's why memorization was so important. Because if you had it here, you didn't need to go to the library. But of course that all changed. Changed with our information revolution. But in that meantime, from going from here to the information revolution, several things went wrong in education. Number one, you came to a classroom, you listened to your professors, and after a while it was the same thing over and over again. It became boring. Science was boring. It wasn't boring when I was reading about science. When I was reading their, their exploits, that was exciting. But in the classroom, it wasn't exciting at all. It was boring. So therefore, what we don't do anymore is try not to be boring. And one thing, one advice that I can give you, be always be amazed of the things that you're learning. They are amazing things. They seem so natural and, and, and so ordinary, but they are not. What you're learning is extraordinary. It's exciting. It's amazing. I just give you three examples of, of technologies that you have in your own hands right now that I only could have dreamt about having. Just a week ago, I was reading in, was it Nature or Science? That scientists just have completed a research study where they now can go into the germline genomic materials of an embryo that had a genetic defect and specifically go in there, into that cell, and repair that defect and produce a completely healthy embryo. That's amazing. Just think about that. Going into the DNA of a whole cell that will develop into a human being and being able to pick out one nucleotide change and change it back to what it should be. That's what we can do nowadays. Think about regenerative medicine. We now can take a skin cell from a person and reprogram it so that it becomes pluripotent, which means that cell now can develop in any other cell of the human body, which means now we are almost at the cusp of being able to regenerate organs from your skin cells. Isn't that amazing? that we can do that, you can do that. And the other big revolution that you're living with every day is big data, big science data, data sciences, the whole internet. Just think about that. Who do you think knows you the best? Your friend? Your parents, your partner, yourself, who knows you the best? Venture to take a guess? I tell you who knows you the best. It's the Amazons, the Googles, the Twitters. <laughs> because they have amassed data on you that you can't even imagine. And then they use computing algorithms to predict what you're going to do next. 
Ever wondered why things come up so easily on the internet? Because they're tracking you, because they know how you think, they know what your preferences are. That's why it comes up. Right? If you have a smartphone with you, you're being probably tracked all the time by these companies. You go into one store, and next morning you look on the internet, and there comes out an ad. Oh, would you like to have this? And I go, how did you know that I was looking for something like that? <laughs> All right. And they're really smart at it, too. Just let me give you an example. In my spare time, which of course about once a month, so I might have an hour here or there, I like to do woodworking. At least I pretend that I can. Not very good at it. But of course, for woodworking, you need something to cut wood with. So I went online and said, okay, let me buy a saw, a hand saw. They're not too expensive. I could probably use them to start out with and learn woodworking. Okay, so I bought a hand saw. Very nice one, too. Well, what they don't tell you when you buy one is that hand sawing is actually very, very difficult. If you're not very skilled at it, you can't cut a piece of wood very straight. Okay, so the hand saw was not the greatest idea, but guess what Amazon sent me next? <laughs> oh, did you ever think about an electric one? <laughs> oh yeah, that might make sense. All right. So I got an electric one, a hand saw, right? Much easier to use. But I was also afraid about my fingers. I like my fingers. Saws are dangerous things, right? So I looked at safety stuff, right? What kind of safety stuff should you have as a woodworker, right? Just looking at, didn't buy anything, whatever, just looked at different websites. And so guess what Amazon sent me just a couple of weeks ago? They sent me, you might want to consider this beautiful saw, table saw. It's really with every feature you possibly can have. But most importantly, it's the only table saw in existence where the blade stops immediately when it has, when it senses flesh. Ah, <laughs> oh. right? So but can you see how they predict everything from data that they have on you? But these technologies, are in your hands. Imagine what you can do with those technologies. Just imagine. So be amazed all the time. Well, the next part that I really went wrong with education is that we have become very distracted. We're constantly distracted, going from one thing to another thing. Well, it's very easy on the internet. I do it too. I mean, I'm not immune to it either. I'm starting to look something up and, oh, that sounds interesting. Let's go there. Oh, there's something else interesting. Let's go over there, right? And hour, two hour has passed and I still don't have my answer, but I learned a lot of other things, right? Then comes a phone and email and all of this stuff and we are very, very distracted. And there comes some scientists and say, oh, what we really all should do is multitask. We can do five things at the same time. We're all great multitaskers. Sure you are. All the evidence says multitasking does not work. Multitasking only works if you do things where there's no thinking required. Then you can multitask. Then you can do several things at the same time. But at a university, you have to think, right? There's cognitive abilities that you have to employ, and those you cannot employ while you're doing other things. You cannot be safe in a laboratory if you're doing five other things at the same time. It does not work. 
And every time you do several things at the same time, it costs you. It's actually less efficient than doing one thing first, then the next one, and then the next one, and then the next one. Doing it that way, that's called deep work. So I encourage you to do deep work. It's the ability to focus without distraction on a cognitively demanding task. It's a skill that allows you to quickly master, and that's important for you, complicated information. And you will learn a lot of complicated information. And it will produce better results in much less time than if you're distracted all the time. So find time to focus on one task at a time. Find that time. I think the other damage that really has been done to higher education is this thing about learning styles. Everyone learns differently. Sure, everyone learns differently, and everyone prefers a certain way of learning. Some are visual learners, some are auditory learners, right? Some need to have things in their hand to learn. But guess what the research says? That in many cases, our preferred style is actually not the most efficient style to learn the material. So yes, we might be visual learners, but this particular material might be actually learned much better tactile, if you actually have it in your hands. How does a real world work? Will anybody ask you out there how you learn best to learn something? No, right? You either learn or you don't. So you have to be proficient in all learning styles. You have to be able to learn no matter how the material is presented to you. That's the important skill for the future. Not memorization, but learning. Learning new things rapidly, quickly, and in depth. And you only can do that if you're employing, employing all learning styles that you're capable of. And you are. Don't limit yourself to a single one. Now, my last piece of advice. During this program, it will be hard. And sometimes, you will be probably very down, very depressed. Because it's so hard, you have so many other things coming in life at the same time. What do you do then? What do you do under those situations? I'll give you one piece of advice here. Go to your closet, get your white coat, put it on, stand beside the mirror and look at yourself in your white coat. And then remember this evening, why did I put this white coat on? What's the meaning of this white coat? How did I feel when I put this on tonight? And I hope that will lift your spirit. And you remember how it felt when you put on the white coat. Now, if it's still not good enough, think about the higher purpose you're serving. You will be part of the healthcare workforce. Think about that purpose. Think about our community. Worldwide and in our communities, 50% of our population suffers from one or more chronic diseases. What does the other half do? They take care of the other half. You know how difficult it is to be a caretaker? To be constantly in contact with people that are hurting, that are in pain? You become depressed yourself. You become anxious. You become sleeplessness. That's not a good situation for us to be in. Did you also know how expensive that is? I, was look, I looked it up. See, the internet is actually really good sometimes. <laughs> to treat 
And I said, to treat, not to cure, just to treat the most common chronic diseases in this country alone for the next 10 years will cost more money than there actually is money. If, you ta if I take all your dollars, all your pennies, all everything you have, including your bank accounts, all physical money, and put it together, it will not be enough to pay to treat those diseases for the next 10 years. That's how expensive that is. When you live in communities like ours that are already economically disadvantaged and you have to pay that kind of money, what effect does it have? Think about that. Once that sinks in, then you need to think about, well, who's going to bring the solutions to this? Who's going to make the new inventions? Who can solve these problems? Who contributes to, to assisting in these problems? Who are those people? The good thing is, I know those people. And at this point, I'd like you to all stand up students here stand up and just turn around 360 degrees okay. that was 180 so you need another 180 <laughs> <laughs> all right so now you saw the people that have the solutions that will contribute to solving these problems because it's going to be you. You are the ones that will do that. And when you're down, think about it. You are the ones that will solve those problems, that will help people in pain, that will help our communities. It will be you. Thank you so very much. Okay, so what is the white coat ceremony? The white coat ceremony signifies a new face in the education of a healthcare professional. ¿Qué significa la ceremonia de bata blanca? La ceremonia de bata blanca significa una nueva fase en la educación del profesional al cuidado de la salud. The white coat is a traditional symbol of the medical clinician, scientist, and other healthcare professional. La bata blanca es un símbolo tradicional del médico, del científico y de otros profesionales al cuidado de la salud. Donning of the white coat represents the knowledge, skill, and integrity of the healthcare professions. Colocar la bata blanca representa el conocimiento, habilidades, e integridad de los profesionales al cuidado de la salud. White coat investiture recognizes a student's entry into a healthcare profession. Investir a los estudiantes con la bata blanca los reconoce como parte de los de las profesiones al cuidado de la salud. It symbolizes them being recognized as junior colleagues. Lo reconoce como colegas que inician. The student's acceptance of the white coat signifies First of all, acceptance of the responsibility for developing and maintaining professional attitudes and behaviors. El aceptar los estudiantes, la bata blanca, significa, primero, aceptar la responsabilidad para desarrollar y mantener actitudes y comportamientos profesionales. Acceptance of the responsibility for maintaining professional relationships with classmates, teachers, patients, and the community. También aceptar la responsabilidad de mantener relaciones profesionales con compañeros de clases, maestros y pacientes, así como con la comun comunidad. It also signifies acknowledgement of the code of ethics for the profession. También conocer los códigos de ética de la profesión. 
and affirmation of the knowledge that a patient, as well as other healthcare professionals, depend upon the accuracy and professionalism of their work. Y también estar consciente que un paciente, así como otros profesionales de la salud, dependen de la veracidad y profesionalismo de su trabajo. So to give you a little bit of the history of the white coat ceremony, the very first ceremony occurred in 1993 at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons. Una poquita historia sobre la ceremonia de la bata blanca. La primera ceremonia se realizó en 1993 en la Universidad de Colombia, Colegio de Médicos y Cirujanos. Dr. Arnold Gold recognized that medical students needed to understand the Hippocratic Oath when they start their education, not at the end. El doctor Arnold Gold reconoció que los estudiantes médicos necesitaban comprender el juramento hipocrático al comenzar su educación y no al final de la misma. Over 100 medical schools now hold a white coat ceremony. Cerca de 100 escuelas médicas realizan actualmente una ceremonia de bata blanca. And it has spread to other healthcare professions, including pharmacy, dentistry, PA, nursing, clinical laboratory science, and BMED too, right? Biomedical Sciences also has a white coat ceremony. Lo anterior se ha extendido a otras profesiones al cuidado de salud, incluyendo farmacia, odontología, asociado médico, enfermeras y ciencias de laboratorio clínico. So the American Society for Clinical Laboratory Science, this is nationwide, has a code of ethics that clinical laboratory scientists have to abide by. The first code is the duty to the patient. So clinical laboratory professionals are accountable for the quality and the integrity of laboratory services they provide. This obligation includes maintaining individual competence in judgment and performance and striving to safeguard the patient from incompetent or illegal practice by others. So el código de ética las los, uh, del laboratorio clínico, las obligaciones, la primera es la obligación al paciente. Los profesionales del laboratorio clínico son responsables por la calidad y integridad de los servicios del laboratorio que proveen. Esta obligación incluye mantener la competencia individual buscando desarrollarse y salvaguardar a los pacientes de las incompetencias y prácticas ilegales que pudieran presentarse. Also, clinical laboratory professionals maintain high standards of practice. They exercise sound judgment in establishing, performing, and evaluating laboratory testing. Los profesionales del laboratorio clínico mantienen altos estándares en su práctica. Ejercitan su buen juicio estableciendo, desarrollando y evaluando exámenes de laboratorio. The second duty is to the colleagues and the profession. Clinical laboratory professionals uphold and maintain the dignity and respect of our profession and strive to maintain a reputation of honesty, integrity, and reliability. También tienen obligación a los colegas y a la profesión. Los profesionales del laboratorio clínico mantienen en alto la dignidad y respeto de nuestra profesión y buscan mantener una reputación de honestidad, integridad y confiabilidad. They also contribute to the advancement of the profession by improving the body of knowledge, adopting scientific advances that benefit the patient, maintaining high standards of practice and education, and seeking fair socio-economic working conditions for members of the profession. También contribuyen al avance de la profesión mejorando sus conocimientos, adoptando avances científicos que beneficien al paciente, mantienen altos estándares en su práctica y en su educación, buscan condiciones de trabajo socioeconómicamente justas para los miembros de la profesión. Clinical laboratory professionals actively strive to establish cooperative and respectful working relationships with other health professionals with the primary objective of ensuring a high standard of care for the patients they serve. También los profesionales del laboratorio clínico buscan activamente establecer relaciones de trabajo respetuosos y cooperativas 
por otros profesionales de la salud por el objetivo primario de asegurar un alto estándar de cuidado hacia el paciente al que se sirve. The third duty is to society. As practitioners of an autonomous profession, clinical laboratory professionals have the responsibility to contribute from their sphere of professional competence to the general well-being of the community. La tercer obligación es la obligación a la sociedad. Como practicantes de una profesión autónoma, los profesionales del laboratorio clínico tienen la responsabilidad de contribuir desde su esfera de competencia profesional hacia el bienestar general de la comunidad. They also comply with relevant laws and regulations pertaining to the practice of clinical laboratory science and actively seek within the dictates of their consciences to change those which do not meet the high standards of care and practice to which the profession is committed. Los profesionales del laboratorio clínico cumplen con leyes relevantes y regulaciones pertinentes a la práctica de la ciencia del laboratorio clínico y buscan activamente dentro de los dictados de su conciencia cambiar aquello que no cumpla los altos estándares de cuidado y prácticas hacia los que la profesión está comprometida. Ok, so uh, we are going to start now with the white coat ceremony. And this is a class of 2018, 2019. That means that you all will be graduating next year. So next December, you will be putting on your white coat again. And this time it will be for a pinning ceremony. So we're going to get started. If I could have the professors up here, Dr. Nadetta. So ahora vamos a comenzar con la celebración. Okay, so as I call your names, you will come up and give your lab coat to the first professor. The next student will just keep on going, okay? No, they're starting right here. Oh, yes, and please go and stand over here by the railing. Okay. Roxanne Cano. Rafael G. Chapa. Eunice Chihuahua. Kila Espinosa. Christy Flores. Paulina Flores. Valerie Hernandez. Marco Ibarra. Karen Leal. Juan Lopez. Stephanie Manriquez. Virginia Miller.
Argentina Olivares. Jose Ortiz Gutierrez. Victor Pérez. Edna Ramirez. Daniel Rodriguez. Victoria Rodriguez. Maya Dries. Mario Salazar. Okay, the next one is going to be a special one. Um, Luis Salinas will receive his white coat from his parents, who are both clinical laboratory scientists and graduates of the program. And I saw his baby picture on the refrigerator at the hospital, okay? <laughs> Never imagined he would be here with us. <laughs> Bernice Sedna. <laughs> Moises Solis. Kevin Souk. <laughs> and Irving Vasquez Hurtado. So together with the faculty, they're going to recite the pledge. You all can take your little papers out there. We gave them cheat notes. <laughs> OK. As a clinical laboratory professional, I strive to maintain and promote standards of excellence in performing and advancing the art and science of my profession. 
preserve the dignity and privacy of patients, uphold and maintain the dignity and respect of our profession, seek to establish cooperative and respectful working relationships with other health professionals, and contribute to the general well-being of the community. Thank you so much for attending. The students have a long and exciting journey ahead. Your support and your understanding is going to be very important for their success. They're going to undergo long hours of study. It's a very demanding and rigorous program. And they're going to have less time for family and friends. Gracias por asistir. Los estudiantes tienen una larga pero excitante jornada por delante. Su apoyo y comprensión será clave para el éxito de nuestros futuros graduados. Largas horas de estudio, un programa demandante y riguroso, y desafortunadamente un poco menos de tiempo para la familia y los amigos. So please join us for refreshments and a tour of the laboratory afterwards. And I want to present to you the class of 2018-2019. Let's give them a hand.